I'm Cami Roberts. I'm the director of the uh, National Coordination Office for NIDRD. Um, and has, I've had a fabulous time over the last day and a half listening to all these presentations. Um, I want to take a minute real quick to thank Susan. Is she still around? Susan <laughs> and NIH for hosting us. <laughs> I also want to thank the organizing committee, which was Susan and Chaitin and Randy and Sandy and Laura and Barry. <laughs> thank you all. Um, all the presenters and moderators, the moderators have a big job to do after this because they have to write up a one-page report on their specific area, so that'll be interesting to, to get back. Um, I want to thank the NIH tech support. They've been fabulous getting the presentations up and making sure that everything's working. Um, and the NCO staff, Wendy and G, who were out in the hall working, of course. <laughs> and Jackie, who changed the slides for us yesterday, and Adrian, who showed up today to do the uh, tech support for everything we needed. So thank you, everybody. Um, so we can all agree that yesterday there was an amazing amount of presentation, an amazing amount of information coming out, the diversity of views and the interactions between everybody. It was really fabulous. Um, and there's ev evidence that there's progress of convergence, but there's still a lot of work to do, and there's some question about how much convergence we need to have, some of the things that I heard today. Um, does there really have to be convergence, or is it, you know, sort of an overlay, or how does it work? So there's lots left to do. So this morning's breakouts delved into all of this a little bit deeper, and so we're going to go through and ask um, the moderators to give us some feedback. And remember at the end, as Jim said yesterday morning, we're looking for actionable items, things that can be done. Um, and everybody is listening. So as part of my job at the NCO, I'm also on detail to the Office of Science and Technology Policy um, in the White House. And the, the workshop reports do get reviewed at the Office of Science and Technology Policy. So the things that you're coming up with here that we're going to do the workshop report on will be read at that level. All of the agencies that are involved in HEC and Big Data and we do have an AI um, inter interagency working group now, um, and so they'll have an opportunity to read this as well. So, um, so give us good things. <laughs> so we're going to get started, I think, with modes of operation. Is that good? <laughs> So we obviously had a couple of bureaucrats on our team uh, because we captured our thoughts in PowerPoint. <laughs> so this was, a, this was a great session. I really enjoyed the panelists' uh, presentations yesterday and the discussions that we had today. Um, it was really interesting, and so thank you to all of you who participated in these discussions. One thing that really came out to me is that um, looking through the lens of, of the uh, of the high performance computing centers was a really interesting way to look at this problem of convergence because in some sense that's where the rubber meets the road and the and the centers are seeing convergence already and having to deal with it already. Deb Agarwal did a really great service to our, our discussions by um, listing a number of uh, use cases that we had been talking around and so these are um, roughly as follows. First of all, a use case that comes from large-scale experiments, so the, so the huge amount of uh, data streaming from large-scale experiments where high-performance computing is need, needed to, um, to deal with that deluge and to analyze the data coming off of it. Um, something that we called AI and machine learning at scale. So these are cases where um, machine learning or artificial intelligence is being done, and uh, they finally have reached a scale where high-performance computing is needed. Simulation requiring machine learning. So this is um, simulation where you want to embed some sort of machine learning or you have machine learning that's driving, for example, an ensemble of simulations or somehow, you know, machine learning is being used in the process of a simulation or a simulation campaign. Um, big data sets requiring high performance computing. So this is oftentimes um, not because of the scale of the computing needed, but because of the scale of the data. And so it's other features of a high performance computing architecture that you might be exploiting for this big data analysis. And then the co-location of data and compute. So the idea that you might want to have data sets that are reused by a community or, um, or served and, and want to have computation alongside that. And high performance computing centers are often the best place to do that. There were a number of suggestions that we teased out from the discussions. Um, these include uh, scalability of tools and capabilities for machine learning, AI, and analysis. So this is basically sort of convergence in the underlying software stack. The need for training of new users and, um, and people to support the new users at the high performance computing centers. Interfaces and access to high performance computing. So there was a lot of discussion about how um, command lines can be intimidating, the blinking cursor in particular. 
And, um, and so having uh, new interfaces that are more comfortable for some of the new users would be, um, would be a big help in terms of um, easing the access to high performance computing. And then the importance of data curation came up a lot. So this means that um, it's not just about providing cycles, but it's also about taking care of the data that is driving a lot of the science. And um, some themes or maybe challenges, and that is uh, one sort of over, uh, overarching theme that came out was that the high performance computing centers of tomorrow, which could be in just a small number of years, will look very different from how they, uh, what they look like today. And um, the convergence was sort of looked at from a couple of different angles, and um, one of which is convergence over a distributed workflow. So this sort of takes in this use case of an um, experimental facility and the streaming data off an experimental facility, and how you might have workflows where there's analysis happening local, locally or on the edge that spills over then into a high-performance computing center. And then something that I guess I would call convergence in situ, which is basically the convergence of machine learning and um, simulation and big data analysis that's happening, basically driven by simulation data. And um, another point was that there's a, there's a need for in more computing at the edge, but also so smarter computing at the edge. So I guess I would also just invite any of the participants to let me know if I've missed anything, and, and we'll, we'll make sure it gets added. Okay, next up is Randy Brandt, discussing software, I think. <laughs> um, so I'd like to especially thank Michaela Taufer for being the moderator for the two sessions on software. And uh, she and her group did a nice job putting it all on a Google Doc, and I, I'm trying to sort of extract a, few, a very small number of high-level things off there, so I don't have PowerPoint. Um, so I think one of the interesting overarching uh, ideas that at least uh, seems to have come out is that it's not like uh, is this cloud versus uh, let's call it HPC machine or big machine. I think that the reality is we're going to live in an ecosystem where all of these are there. And also to bring in I think um, what Pete brought in about the edge computing and that whole model of of bringing data in from various sources, uh, having them uh, go through various levels of processing until they reach some more centralized facility for storage and uh, analysis is an important model that we really should think of, therefore, edge computing, uh, cloud computing, and HPC as a sort of all equal partners, and that what, you know, the, the modern computational model will be one where these are all being connected together and working on different parts of the problem. And so I think with that perspective really gives you a, a pretty important uh, set of, uh, of uh, challenges that we need. And so I, I thought one of the really interesting ideas that came out is with HPC we have MPI. And MPI, what it gives you is the ability in a single place to sort of describe the entire computation somewhat from a top-down point of view, meaning this is the overall computation, this is what I'm trying to do, this is how it's partitioned. Whereas with a more the edge computing style of, of work currently, what it's done is, is a bottom-up construction that you build the, the software that will run on the edge devices, you build the software that will run in the core, you uh, cobble them together with various uh, pro communication protocols, and it becomes essentially a distributed system development problem. You have to worry about fault tolerance. You have to worry about uh, bandwidth issues. And you end up with these very ad hoc uh, but potentially highly engineered solutions to get it all to work. And so is there sort of more the MPI for, for this uh, model, too, that gives you a, a more top-down perspective that lets you talk, write the code or write code that can run partially on the edge, partially in the cloud, and partially uh, in a large machine and have uh, ways that those connect together and operate and deal with issues about performance, about the desire to perhaps adjust which goes on in which place and uh, make that uh, more straightforward. I thought there's some really interesting, if, if part of the goal of this is to come up with a solicitation that the NSF could uh, produce, this would definitely be a, a source of an interesting solicitation. So I thought those were some very powerful ideas. Uh, another, I thought, 
interesting I, uh, thing that came out was uh, the whole issue of uh, productivity, that right now there's these frame, various frameworks that have come up around uh, different areas, especially in the data analysis world, there's very powerful machine learning frameworks, data analytics frameworks, and so forth. And somewhat frameworks for more the simulation perspective. And uh, I, I guess the general thinking is this is the way the world is going to work, that, the, that software is going to be more kind of, you'll hide the complexity of machines underneath frameworks. Uh, and that's very powerful. The problem is now, if I want to do these convergence kind of things where I'm trying to make best use of some amount of simulation, some amount of machine learning, and these different parts, now the frameworks have to talk to each other, and they're really not designed for that right now. So I think um, sort of how do we uh, describe or create workflows that will <coughs> let us connect these together, make sure that they have appropriate APIs and interfaces that... Um, makes this possible, uh, uh, I think, is also a, sort of a, a direction to think about for the whole software issue of software productivity. And then finally, I think, uh, as was we saw here, I think that um, I think we need a better understanding of use cases, um, or at least a, a better compilation of, of what are some of the use cases that are, are being looked at here, because um, I felt like especially some of the discussions yesterday were a little bit, um, you know, the different side views of an elephant that everyone had different thinking about what what really uh, kind of applications they were talking about, and they gave very different perspective as a result of that. So those are just some high-level things. We, of course, had a lot more discussion than that. Thank you. And on to the hardware group. So the hardware group uh, had a, some really great discussions. Well, I'm going to try to uh, hit on the uh, common suggestions that emerged. But uh, those of you that were present, uh, uh, if I forget something that you were particularly passionate about, please remind me. <laughs> um, so I think the, there's a lot of uh, that's in common with what you've already heard. That there's there certainly is a a lot of commonality there. We have a lot of hypotheses about how much commonality there is. I think that one of the uh, actionable suggestions is to gather more data. So at the level of uh, hardware and particularly of uh, operating systems, gathering information um, on the workloads uh, to better understand um, how the systems are currently being used um, would be really important. Um, there's also, I think, an opportunity to start thinking about um, some common end-to-end um, uh, -end benchmarks, and I mean end-to-end -end as, as opposed to, say, kernel benchmarks, so that they are looking at the entire, uh, say, components of the workload. Um, this would not necessarily be any single figure of merit that you could use to say, this system is better than this system. Rather, they'd be used um, to help uh, expose um, bottlenecks and other limitations um, in the uh, hardware systems. There are a number of areas where we feel that uh, the current uh, hardware um, is limited in both uh, its ability to support uh, HPC and big data or AI workloads. Uh, so these included um, the interconnect, and this is interconnect writ quite broadly, so the uh, node to memory, uh, node to node, uh, um, generally the fabric and even interfabric um, interconnections. Um, both many HPC and many uh, big data workloads are memory bound. So uh, looking at uh, innovations um, in uh, integrating uh, memory and processing uh, would be uh, uh, potentially quite transformative. Um, it's also recognized that we, uh, we don't make um, effective use of the systems that we have. Uh, there are a number of reasons why that's challenging. Um, there certainly are some of the software issues at the same time. Gathering actionable information about how things are performing is difficult. So um, 
one of the things that um, a lot of us would like would be performance counters, but particularly for uh, performance counters for, for example, your network where um, that's shared, that actually uh, can be a security hole. Uh, it's a side channel. And so uh, one suggestion would be to address this problem and figure out what is the actual information that you would like to have if you're a performance engineer at that level, and how would you deliver it <clears throat> in a way that didn't compromise your security. Um, we don't have a solution for that now. Um, and then um, file systems. So uh, this also, uh, as with many of these things, it also crosses partly into um, the software. Uh, but the reality is that the file systems that HPC systems tend to rely on are inappropriate for HPC as well as for big data, and that there's been a lot of progress in uh, um, uh, data stores systems uh, more generally in the big data uh, area and taking advantage of that and finding ways to move forward um, from the HPC space and also exploiting some of the things that are known uh, in both of those um, would be very beneficial for both um, HPC and big data. Um, another thing that came up um, was end to end uh, wide area networking performance. There was some disagreement in the breakout about uh, whether research was needed here. I'm going to argue that it is. The reason that there was an argument that it wasn't needed was that if you really, if you're willing to spend the money and the time, you can make it work now. Um, and that is true. Um, the problem is that you have to be willing to spend the money and the time to make it work. Um, to me, that's a research question. Is how do you make the systems more performance robust without a lot of manual intervention? Um, and that, uh, I think, is an open question. We also talked a bit about power efficiency, um, acknowledging that this is a, a challenge in the commercial world and there will, they will be addressing it, but we believe that they'll probably address it in a more evolutionary way, and so there are opportunities to take what we might call a more discontinuous um, approach and explore what that might mean. Um, and then, um, finally, uh, again, we expect a rich um, space of, of hardware. We don't think that there'd be a single system that will do everything, um, but that those systems will need to work together because the workflows um, tend to be um, quite broad. And we noted that systems are really designed for certain sort of data structures and methods. They aren't designed for particular areas of science or particular specific application areas. And so looking at them that way rather than saying, well, that's an HPC system or that's a big data system or that's an AI system. Um, is a more effective way to think about um, the configuration of the hardware and how it's optimized. Okay, so for my uh, partners in the breakout, is there anything else you'd like me to add? Okay. I'm going to take a quick break here before I bring Tony up and just ask anybody in the audience if there's anything that you wanted to hear and didn't hear or something that you heard and thought, oh, yeah, but there's also this. It may not have come out in the breakout groups. Anybody? <laughs> So Bill talked about uh, networking and, and security associated with networking, right? We face that all the time, right? We have optical fibers out of the ocean, right? Uh, we have multi-tier level of encryption within the same pipe, right? Uh, tier ones are for X, uh, X amount of ways, tier two and all, right? So I, I think, and we, 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 we created something called private link, Amazon private link. So it's where a collaboration can, within the link, across different domain, across world, actually, can communicate, right? So I see that there is, there is a huge potential that, you know, ESNet is, is already has a direct connect with, with major providers, and so does other, 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 other uh, organizations. So I think there's a, there's a way that these kind of security, what you mentioned, uh, can be addressed, yeah. Wait, so, so the kind of security um, issue I mentioned is very different. It's, um, it's called a side channel. It's if I, I can bleed data from one network to another by inputting to the uh, performance counters that I might want to require of that. That's the security mark. Maybe somebody who has encryption doesn't do that. Um, and so uh, it's a reason why many systems will
Yes. So the way we try to challenge, uh, uh, address that is uh, that there is something called Big Mac or something like that, where you break out the IP, you break out the TCP. The TCP does not have full information itself. And uh, we can discuss more details. Yeah, so, uh, so, uh, so, so, so no longer the quantity, you call it fundamental, becomes fundamental because you break it out and, and assemble it on fly. So we, can, we should talk about yeah, it. Yeah, I think we were talking about different things and leave that as well. <laughs> Good, another connection made. <laughs> Anybody else have anything they want to? Laura mentioned, I don't think I can. Uh, you mentioned uh, about um, tools to help with HPC. I mean, interfaces that would make it easier to use these systems. I think that's what you were getting at, right? There are some tools around that are available. I don't know, we can talk about it offline, but yeah. Anybody else? Okay, so I'm going to welcome Tony up <laughs> to give us his wisdom. Thanks very much, Kevin. Right, uh, yeah, no, it's been a, an interesting meeting with lots of people knowing lots of stuff. And um, from the first talks, uh, you know, in the first session on the science uh, and uh, Jeff Snyder's fascinating talk about Uber and, and the challenges of self-driving vehicles, which look pretty intimidating to me, and I don't think I'll be getting into a self-driving vehicle without a passenger, without a driver spare for some time. Um, uh, and then we had uh, people looking at the software challenges, and, and I thought that was extremely interesting too. Just to pick out two, Raghu Ramakrishnan talked from a very much uh, a, a commercial IT perspective. He had intelligent edge, he had intelligent cloud in the middle, um, but it was clear that HPC didn't really figure on his agenda at all. I mean, databases did, but HPC, as we understand scientific computing, was, was nowhere to be seen. And that was illustrated, I think, by Fred's talk, which gave a very nice example of the stuff that we're doing in scientific computing in systems that you couldn't really do uh, on the commercial cloud with the software stacks that they support. So I think there is a distinction to be made, and I thought that was extremely interesting. And then the hardware challenges and opportunities, lots of people with lots of experience in operating these systems who really know about the bottlenecks, and, and that was really, again, an interesting session. And, and finally, the, the, the challenges in modes of operations and stuff like that. So we've heard about those. So, um, so I just want to make a few points then in trying to sum up my impressions. Um, I actually, firstly, I think we are seeing some convergence of hardware for HPC, big data, and machine learning at, for example, the DOE labs. And so just to take uh, two examples, one is, uh, is Rick Stevens, who wasn't here, but he's collaborating with NIH uh, uh, on cancer projects, and he has these things called Campbell benchmarks, which cover different uh, three, three different areas of, of the cancer challenge, and they've run those on the big machines at Argonne and now at Oak Ridge, and they're looking towards predicting what these things will give on exascale. So I think that these things show that they can perform on a, a variety of, of, of uh, HPC and machine learning challenges. And similarly, the summit early science results, which both cover simulation but also machine learning, to me, were impressive that you could use that same architecture and it actually was uh, functional. And I don't think my second point then is that I don't think HPC and scientific computing are very interesting to IT companies. It's a very, very small piece of their budget. Yes, both you know Amazon and Google and, and, and Microsoft to some extent do some scientific applications, but in their scheme of, of revenue generation, it's a very tiny portion. So uh, that is why I think there was a sort of disconnect between Rago's vision and the rest of this, this, this uh, agenda that we have, because we care about scientific computing. We build systems that you can't easily replicate anywhere else. Um, thirdly, I like very much um, Pete Beckman's vision. I, I've now heard it three times, so maybe I'm getting brainwashed about <laughs> edge, cloud, and HPC, and actually understanding the ramifications. Uh, so Kirsten was talking about streaming a petabyte per second from her instruments 
you know, to the cloud or, or to the HPC center. And I think that's uh, you need to have a distribution of understanding what you can do at the edge, uh, what you can do in the middle, which I think Pete on his slide called the fog, and then what you do in the, in the center, the HPC uh, center. So I, I think we do have a vision that one of the challenges for the agency is to think about a framework where we can support um, programming using uh, uh, software infrastructure and services to encompass going from the edge uh, to cloud and to the HPC center. And I think that's a, a, a real challenge and, and, and a possible uh, theme for, for funding agencies. Networking, uh, I mean, just to pick up um, Bill's point, uh, this is not networking within the system, this is networking between sites for big data transfers. We routinely transfer uh, petabytes of data from CERN to my lab in the UK, it's a tier one center, and, and that petabytes are done relatively quickly and, and using um, what we, we didn't call a science DMZ to use ES net stem. Uh, particle physicists, of course, invent their own, and they called it, rather unwisely in my view, they called it a firewall bypass. And so I, <laughs> this didn't seem to me very wise. So, uh, so we're now calling it a research data transfer zone. And I would distinguish, <laughs> I would distinguish between um, the UK has specialized on, uh, has very high bandwidth backbones, uh, but it's really for general use for universities, the NRENs and things like this. It hasn't got the focus on research computing end to end. And I think it's possible, but I think you need easy tools to explore the bottlenecks. I think it's great that NSF, for example, has funded, you know, exploring DMZs in, I think it's something like 100 universities, but there's still a lot of ignorance out there, and I still see experimentalists going back to their universities with armfuls of, you know, terabyte disks. It's like this, it's a sort of manual version of sneaker net. So I think there's a lot to be done to, dis, to dispel ignorance, and having easy deployable tools where you can find the bottleneck. Maybe your, your, your server's wrongly configured. Maybe it's all Microsoft's fault. And that's all possible, but you need to make it so it's easy to find out where the bottlenecks are. So I think there is things to be done there, which I, I, I think you can encourage work in that area. Um, the, the other thing that, that I care about was, was mentioned uh, NIH and uh, other research organizations are encouraging uh, researchers to publish fair data that's findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And exactly what that means and how you implement it is rather important. And the FAIR group talk about machine actionable metadata. And actually how you implement that uh, uh, and how you put some semantics in. So, for example, uh, the only thing is when I was at Microsoft that Microsoft and Google ever agreed on was the thing called schema.org, which is a way you can put some, a little bit of semantic information in a website, for example. So you can, if you're looking for Casablanca, the search engine will know that this is Casablanca the town, whereas actually I'm looking for Humphrey Bogart and I want Casablanca the movie. So you can put little bits of semantic information. And, and schema.org seems to me a way you can actually uh, encourage communities to add their vocabularies to schema.org and you can actually do semantic information that way. But those are things to be explored. It may not be the best way, but it is something that's supported by the major IT companies. So um, fair data, I think, is important and that's an area that I think does re require looking at. Last six point um, is R is for reusability in FAIR, but there's another R which is reproducibility. And that's also very important. And when you do computational science, um, reproducibility is a little more complicated because you can attack a scientific problem using this algorithm or that algorithm. They're both meant to give the same science, the physics at the end, but they don't have the same code. So reproducibility is slightly subtle, but certainly you need access to the software. And so actually making the software linked to your publication, just like you link the data, is, I think, an important area. And so, for example, uh, in DOE, 
OSTI, the, the Office of Science and Technical Information. Um, how many people have heard of OSTI? For those of you who haven't, it was set up in 1947 in response to uh, the, the, the then President Roosevelt, who recognized all the science that had been done during the Second World War, not just the, the Manhattan Project, but the other stuff in radar and everything else. And he wanted jobs to be created and businesses for the returning soldiers and the returning population. And so he asked Vannevar Bush, and Vannevar Bush recommended setting up something. And General Groves, who did the security for Manhattan Project, I'm not sure he did it very well, um, because Stalin and Beria had two copies of, of their plans. Um, uh, but anyway, Joe Groves set up the Office of Scientific and Technical Information, which was to distribute the results in an open way of all federally funded research projects which were not classified. And I think OSTI and agencies like that can have a role in, in fair data and, and also the software and reproducibility. So I don't know quite how that translates into an action, but that's, I think, something for the agencies to think about. Uh, the last thing I'd like to comment on is about data science education. I mean, I think it's important. We had a discussion about whether you should teach operating systems in a computer science course nowadays. Seems to me incredible you wouldn't, but I can see that you know, writing a kernel of an operating system is actually rather a, a specialist skill, so maybe we need to rethink all those. But in, in data science, I would distinguish at least three different roles. There's the data engineer, that's the person who gets the data from the satellite and does all the sort of calibration and, and, and putting the patches together to build up a data set, which you can then hand over to the, the data analyst. So the data engineer is the person who has the skills to go and get the data from the instruments, whether it's a satellite or whether it's a, 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 a neutron source or a synchrotron, uh, and put it into a form that scientists can begin to use. The data analysts are people who actually can get results out of that they get new science out of that. And I would distinguish two types. One is, if you like, applied machine learning and AI. And, and that's actually what I'm trying to set up at my group in the UK at the lab. Uh, we'd like to find out how the existing machine learning um, algorithms work on the various aspects of data. And you'll find that there are some gaps, that some work well, some don't work so well. And you'll find, I believe, an agenda for doing some research into AI, which is the second role. So research into AI is, is rather different from applying existing. And the question is, can you make the tools uh, usable for ordinary mortals, the existing tools, where they won't make foolish mistakes about applying these uh, Bayesian methods or, or deep learning to their data? And I think those are uh, interesting challenges and exactly how you you, you, you explore that in an agency, I, I'm not quite sure. Um, the last thing is, is about data curation, which comes data management, data cleaning, and all this sort of stuff, and metadata. These are things that are skills, and we need to teach them, and there will be lots of jobs in those spaces besides the, the high-profile data analysts. So data engineers and data curators are going to be important areas where we need more people in the US and elsewhere to actually go and fill the need for managing this huge amounts of data that's coming in. And the good thing about it from my perspective is that you can teach people in the university context and they can have an academic career, but they're also employable in industry. And I think that's a good thing for, for the young population. So I found it a very interesting and wide ranging uh, conference and uh, given me plenty to think about. So thanks very much to the organizers. Thank you, Kami. We have two minutes. Any other comments, questions? I did finish exactly <laughs> <We're good>. on time. <laughs> well, there, see? <laughs> I think NIH doesn't keep their clocks like NIST does. <laughs> Any questions, comments? Peter? Yeah, I find myself, oh yeah. I find myself thinking, if, if, you, if someone gave you 10 seconds, what would you say is the tall tent pole? What's the problem? You know, on the on the interface between traditional hack and big data, if you want to call it that, 
I mean, uh, for example, I post that in our working group in the hardware, and, well, you can actually just have specialised hardware, just like you have a bus to transport people and an automobile for one person. No one questions that. So maybe we don't have a problem at the interface. But um, anyway, if anybody got any, has any sort of summarising <laughs> comment on that. In the hardware session, there was lots of talks about the new chips coming out, and I think you will see those deployed at the edges as much as in the, in the, in the big centre. And I think that the interesting challenge is, is finding out what you can do at the edge and what you should do at the edge rather than transferring all the data without any processing. So I, I think the, the, the edge is a very interesting area to explore. Anybody else? My own take on that, too, is it's all possible, but it's really hard right now, especially <laughs> the integration of the edge and sure. connecting it to the cloud. So I, I think it sort of comes down to a productivity problem, is can we make this so that it's uh, more easily done and therefore uh, we can enable more people to do it for more applications? And also, you know, on the yes, people have definitely demonstrated that these big machines can do some pretty wicked machine learning applications. It's the old, you can crush a lot of flies with a hammer. You don't need <laughs> you don't need fly swatters anymore. But the um, um, you know the question becomes sort of, a, a, again, an economic model is can we deliver these kind of capabilities at a lower cost than the big iron machines cost? Okay. And that, though, we got one more. <laughs> Thank you. So in case anyone's uh, interested, we have just about an hour ago announced our next system at NERSC, NERSC 9, um, which will be called Perlmutter. Um, and it's a system that is explicitly designed um, to handle uh, data, big data type workloads. We've got a number of technological innovations that we've deployed specifically for these workloads that I wasn't allowed to talk about before. Um, if anyone's interested in hearing more about it, I can uh, talk to you about it now that we can talk about it publicly. Um, but I'm also very cognizant that it's, it's midday and I don't want to take up time in this meeting. Great, thank you. Congratulations, Congratulations yes. <laughs> Good timing. <laughs> okay, well, thank you all very much. We appreciate it. We should have a workshop report out in a few months. The moderators are due, have their papers due to us in a month, and then we have to sort of synthesize and have the, the groups get together and decide on some actionable items that maybe agencies can, can follow. So thank you all again very much. I appreciate it. Have a good rest of your day.